You probably wonder, for good reason, how the credit application process works and why it's so different from one type of loan to the next. For instance, how can a credit card company pre-approve me for a card? Where do they get the information they need and how do they use it? And if the credit card company gets all this information on me, can't the bank or the mortgage company get it too? Why do I have to go through this long and drawn out process to apply for a mortgage? It's just a, another loan, right? The previous lecture was about the role of information in the financial markets. One of the most important uses of information is to help lenders figure out whether they should lend to a potential borrower. Lenders use the term credit analysis to describe this process of gathering information and using it to come to a decision about whether to lend to a borrower, and if so, what terms and conditions they should also put on the loan. In this lecture, we'll learn about how credit analysis works, and we'll also learn a little bit about where it can go wrong. As you might expect, credit analysis has evolved and changed tremendously over the past half century, thanks to advances in information technology. And for the most part, these advances in credit analysis have been really beneficial for society because they vastly expanded credit availability. People and businesses who would have had no chance to get credit 30, 20, or even 10 years ago now find that they have the chance to borrow. And as we learned in the first lecture, everyone can improve his or her life if they're able to borrow wisely. So part of our story in this lecture will be about how computers and the internet play a big role in credit analysis. But all these innovations in information technology are simply trying to translate the traditional system of credit analysis, which actually works pretty well, into hard numbers. The traditional system of credit analysis is often referred to as an expert system because it relies on a human expert, like a loan officer in a bank, to use her own analytical skills and experience to judge whether a potential borrower is creditworthy. Now, just because the expert system relies on a human being, this doesn't mean that it can't be, well, systematic. And in fact, one of the oldest and best known expert systems is still at the heart of much of the credit analysis that gets done even by the fastest computers running the most advanced software. This expert system is called the five C's of credit analysis, or just the five C's for short. They're capacity, conditions, collateral, capital, and character. Let's look at each one of these and see what they can tell us about a borrower's creditworthiness. First, there's capacity. This term has more than one dimension, but we'll start with financial capacity. In other words, a borrower's capacity to take on debt and make the payments on any loans they might take out. One of the main ways we measure a borrower's financial capacity is in terms of their income, since just about every borrower intends to pay the loan out of their future earnings. A lender will examine not only how large a borrower's income is, but they'll also spend a lot of time analyzing how dependable this income is likely to be in the future. This dependability of income is really critical since many loans are paid back over a long period of time. For individual borrowers, the dependability of future income is related to the type of job a person has and how long they've been in that position. For example, someone who's been working as a nurse at a local hospital for 10 years probably has a pretty reliable income. On the other hand, someone whose income is based on commissions, like a salesperson, has less dependable income. Some years are great, and some are lean. Trying to estimate the dependability of a business's income is even more challenging. The lender has to forecast how much the business will earn in coming years, which depends not only on how well the business itself is run, but also what the competitors in the market are doing and where the whole industry is headed. For example, Think about trying to estimate the income of companies making mobile phones. There's a lot of competition, and new products are being introduced almost daily. It would be really tough for even the best loan officers to make a good prediction in this case. The lender's estimate of a borrower's capacity to make payments on their loans is largely driven by their prediction of the borrower's income. Over time, lenders have learned that there's a limit on the share of income that borrowers can devote to making their loan payments. For individuals, for example, that limit is usually about one-third of their income. 
most people seem to be able to pay back all their loans on time and in full if they can devote less than a third of their income to paying back all the loans they've taken out, including their mortgage, credit cards, car payments, and so on. Experience has shown that if people have to spend more than a third of their income paying back their loans, then they're in a precarious position. An unexpected medical bill or car repair can leave them short of money to pay back one or more of their loans. There's not really a universal income limit on business borrowing. The customary limits vary across industries, and even then, some companies seem to be able to comfortably support a lot more debt than their competitors do. This means that it's even more difficult in the case of business lending to assess a company's true capacity to borrow. Another important part of financial capacity is how many other loans and what kinds a potential borrower has already taken out. In other words, lenders are very careful to measure how much of your borrowing capacity you've already used up. In addition to financial capacity, there's also a second dimension of capacity, the legal capacity to borrow. This is primarily an issue for business borrowers, and it comes from the fact that restrictions on future borrowing may be written into loan contracts. A business may have ample financial capacity to borrow, but previous loan agreements may place specific limits on the borrower's total debts. As you can see, every lender needs to collect a lot of information about a potential borrower's income and future prospects in order to examine their capacity to borrow. One of the five C's that's closely related to capacity is conditions, as in the economic conditions during the time that this loan will be paid back. For example, if the economy is going into a recession, this increases the chances that people will get laid off, which of course lowers the incomes they expect to earn on average. Economic conditions are especially important in business loans because these loans are often used to fund the development of brand new products or other new ventures. Some new products may not sell very well unless the economy is growing robustly. Luxury items like designer handbags, for example. At the other extreme, a recession may be the perfect time to expand a chain of discount retail stores. So a lender may be more willing to make a loan for this project during a recession than during an economic boom. Everything else equal, of course. Again, understanding the impact of economic conditions on a particular borrower's ability to repay a loan is a complex task that requires a lot of information and analysis. In the case of business loans, the lender will have to put some effort into understanding the business the company is in and how this particular business is usually affected by the economy. You're probably thinking that there's more than a little overlap between capacity and conditions. A borrower's capacity to borrow depends on economic conditions. This is true. And it's also true that economic conditions can affect the other three C's of credit analysis as well. This serves to make the job of credit analysis even more complex and challenging, and interesting, too. The next C of credit analysis is collateral. In the previous lecture, we learned all about how collateral is important for mitigating the information problems that get in the way of borrowing and lending. Also, when a loan is secured by collateral, the collateral helps ensure that the lender can recover most, if not all, of the money the borrower owes in the event that the borrower defaults on the loan. In that case, the lender would seize or repossess the collateral and then try to sell it or otherwise use it to earn money. For instance, sometimes when homes are repossessed, they're rented out instead of being sold. In fact, after the financial crisis of 2008, Many American banks unintentionally took on the additional role as serving as property management companies because they ended up owning thousands of homes that they couldn't sell and tried to rent them out instead. The collateral part of credit analysis is all about determining the most accurate value possible for the collateral that the borrower is offering. For a few types of loans, figuring the value of collateral is not very difficult. If the collateral is a car, for example, it's pretty easy to find out the value of a new or used car. But in general, it takes a lot of effort to find the right price for collateral. Think about a mortgage loan, for example. All houses are different, the value of the house depends a lot on its specific location, and it's not so easy to tell whether a house is in good shape or not. So a lender will often delegate the job of valuing a house to a professional home appraiser. 
But even then, the credited analyst can't just sit back and relax. The value of all homes depends on the economic conditions in the places where they're located. If a big local employer shuts down its factory and lays off hundreds of people, then the value of houses in that town will fall. There's that connection between economic conditions and the other four C's again. For businesses who are investing in all kinds of specialized physical capital, like assembly lines, custom software, specially built factories and office buildings, the valuation of collateral gets even tougher. Many of the items that a business can potentially pledge as collateral are one of a kind, so there is not really a market to help the credit analyst assign an accurate price to the collateral. As you might suspect then, many lenders don't want to accept the specialized collateral and will only make loans backed by things that are easier to value. And if, a, and if a business doesn't have many of these things, well, that's too bad. They can't borrow very much. Sometimes lenders are legally prevented from accepting certain business assets as collateral. For example, some countries only permit real property, that is, land and buildings, to be pledged as business collateral. This policy ends up hurting small businesses because they tend not to own any real property. They do have assets, but these assets are the equipment they use to produce the goods and services they sell. But because they're not allowed to pledge their equipment as collateral for a loan, small companies are locked out of the loan markets in these countries. Hopefully, this gives you an idea of how difficult it is to put an accurate value on most pieces of collateral. And we haven't even talked about how expensive it is for a lender to actually repossess a borrower's collateral and then try to sell it. When it comes right down to it, most lenders don't want to have to repossess the collateral. They'll usually try to work with a borrower who's having difficulties and find a way for them to keep paying their loan rather than having to go through all the hassle and expense of repossessing and selling these items. After the financial crisis of 2008, for example, there were over 10 million so-called mortgage workouts during the next four years. In most of these workouts, the lenders and borrowers simply negotiated a plan for the borrower to come, up with the to come up with the missed payments and gradually catch up with their loan. In some cases, the payments on the mortgage are reduced by lowering the interest rate on the mortgages or lengthening the term on the mortgage loan. The goal of these mortgage workouts was to enable the homeowner to avoid defaulting on the mortgage and then losing the home through foreclosure. The fourth C of credit analysis is related to collateral. It's capital. Capital is the value of the other things that a borrower owns that they could sell or otherwise use to generate cash in order to repay the loan. As in the case of collateral, this is not really the preferred way that the borrower would repay the loan. Everyone would rather have the borrower pay back the loan out of their income. But if a borrower defaults on the loan and the lender takes the borrower to court to collect on the loan, the court will expect the borrower to use all of his or her resources, including the other things they own, to repay the loan. Capital is technically the difference between the value of all the things you own and the total value of all the debts you owe to others. So by capital, we really mean the net worth of the person or the business. If you know a little accounting, then you know we also use the word equity to refer to the capital or net worth of a business or a person. Capital provides an extra cushion of safety for the lender in case the borrower falls on hard times and can't repay the loan, and if the true value of the collateral turns out to be lower than the lender thought it was. If the borrower has some capital, this means that there are at least a few things that the borrower owns free and clear that can be sold, hopefully, for cash to help to repay the loan. Capital works very much like collateral. In fact, Capital also has the same incentive effects that collateral does. In a previous lecture, we learned that collateral helps mitigate the adverse selection and moral hazard problems of borrowing. And capital works the same way, by making sure that the borrower has something to lose if they default. The more capital a borrower has, the more they stand to lose if they default on their loans. This incentive effect of capital is so important that one of the ways that we regulate banks and other financial companies is to require them to have enough capital. I'll have more to say about that in a future lecture. Well, we have four of the five C's of credit analysis in place. Capacity, conditions, collateral, and capital. 
I've saved what I think is the most interesting of the five C's for last, character. Character is about your integrity as a borrower. When you take on a responsibility, how seriously do you take it and how hard do you try to live up to your responsibilities? That's what character is trying to measure. There's no way to measure character directly. We can assign numbers to capacity, well, financial capacity at least, as well as to conditions, collateral, and capital. But how do you measure character? There are lots of indirect ways to measure character. For example, a lender can simply look at your track record of meeting all your other financial obligations, such as paying your monthly electric bill or phone bill or the rent on your apartment. Do you pay on time every time, or do you send in payments late every couple of months? Whether and how you paid back previous loans is a very good indication of character. Did you ever default on a loan or get behind in payments? Did you pay off loans early? These examples show what kind of information about your character that people can infer from your financial history. But other things give clues about your character, too. How long you've worked in your current job, for example, can give information about your character. For example, suppose two borrowers are similar in every respect, except that one has held the same job for 10 years and the other one has changed jobs every 18 months over the past 10 years. Does the second person sound more or less reliable than the first? Although it's easy to understand character on an individual level, how can we think about the character of a business? With businesses, we usually use the term reputation instead of character, but it's really referring to the same commitment to meeting financial obligations. And we measure a business's reputation for repayment the same way we measure the character of individual borrowers. Does the business pay its bills on time and its other loan payments too? If the answer is yes, a business builds up a reputation for paying its debts, and this factors positively into the analysis of its credit. So there are the five C's of credit analysis. As we learned earlier, in the old days, a loan officer would gather information about each potential borrower's five C's, and then this person would use her own knowledge and experience to come to a decision about whether to make the loan. Over time, many lenders started to adopt rating systems to use in conjunction with the five C's. The best borrowers would get a one, the next best a two, and so on. These rating systems tried to make the loan officer's decisions a bit more consistent across different loan officers and across time. But the categories themselves were not truly standardized or objective. Nonetheless, rating systems like these remain in place at least informally with many lenders. That's because they're still pretty effective. Of course, they're not perfect. Even though the five C's use a lot of numbers, many of these numbers are estimates or projections, which can be way off. For example, in the run-up to the financial crisis of 2008, credit analysts overestimated both the future economic conditions and the value of the housing collateral backing up millions of mortgage loans. Lending and borrowing have a human element that can never be reduced to a number. Even the most statistically advanced credit analysis system can be made better if an experienced person who might have even interacted with some of the borrowers in the past on previous loans can check over the recommendations that come from the computer program and overrule them if they see fit. Given how much our information technology has improved over the past five decades, though, it was inevitable that lenders would harness this technology to make their job of credit analysis easier. Information technology did two things. First, it enabled machines to estimate statistical models of borrower behavior. There are thousands and thousands of tedious calculations that go into this process, so without cheap and fast computers, it's just not practical to do this. In addition, the IT revolution also made it possible to store and use more data on actual borrower behavior than ever before. So as computing power became faster and cheaper, lenders could estimate more sophisticated models on more data, which helped improve their ability to tell good borrowers from bad ones. This has generally been really beneficial for society because it made it possible to extend credit to millions more deserving borrowers. But it has a downside too. It's really easy to tweak computer models. And there's a good bit of evidence that the lending standards embedded in many credits and many lenders' credit models were being watered down during the 2004 to 2007 period in the US. 
millions of mortgage and other loan applications that would have been rejected a few years earlier were being approved during this time. In retrospect, too many weak loans were made, and this is part of what made the downturn that began in 2008 so severe. Keep in mind, though, that these models are just tools, and it's up to us to use them well. And given the choice, most of us would want to have better tools. One model that has become a standard tool of credit analysis is the credit scoring model. Lenders build credit scoring models by using statistical methods, mostly regression analysis, to identify borrower characteristics that affect creditworthiness and to measure the impact of these variables on creditworthiness. Then they use this information to put together a literal scoring system for borrowers. Each borrower characteristic earns a score based on the value of that characteristic. For example, we could have a credit scoring model that gives a borrower one point for every $5,000 of income they earn. So a borrower with a $60,000 income would earn 12 points, and a borrower with a $100,000 income would earn 20 points. Each characteristic that is measured for the credit scoring model earns some amount of points. And yes, the points can be negative for bad things, like the number of times a borrower defaulted in the past five years. If the borrower's total number of points, that is, his credit score, is high enough, then the borrower gets a loan. If the score isn't quite high enough, maybe the borrower is offered a smaller loan or the same loan with a higher interest rate. And if the score is too low, then the borrower's application for a loan is denied. The first credit scoring models were developed for business loans in the 1960s. Eventually, credit scoring models for individual borrowers also came into widespread use. By far, the most well-known and widely used credit scoring model at this time in, 20, in 2012 is the one used by Fair Isaac and Company, a model that gives us the FICO score. Whenever people talk about their credit score, chances are they actually mean their FICO score. Let's take a couple of minutes to learn a little bit about what goes into this important credit score. We don't know exactly what variables go into your FICO score or how they count. That's because the actual credit scoring model is the intellectual property of Fair Isaac and Company, and they need to protect this property. But the company does tell us the broad categories of information that go into the FICO score and how much each category counts in the overall score. According to the MyFICO.com website, 35% of the FICO score is determined by your payment history, and 30% is determined by the amounts you owe. As for the rest, 15% of the FICO score is determined by the length of your credit conditions, 10% by the types of credit used, and the remaining 10% by what is called new credit. Keep in mind that each category is made up of many pieces of information that go into the credit scoring model. For example, in the category called length of credit history, there are numbers about not only how long you've had certain loans and credit cards, but how long it's been since you've used some of your credit cards. Similarly, the category called new credit collects information on how many new credit accounts you've opened and how many credit inquiries have been made on you recently, among other things. Note that the FICO credit scoring model tries to include information that gets at all the five C's that we've learned about in this lecture but it can only use information that can be measured in numbers. Then it scores this information and gives a score that ranges between 300 and 850. The median FICO score in the US, again, the median divides the total set of scores in half so that half are above and half are below this score, is about 720. It's important to know that the FICO score does not take into account all the credit information about you that would be relevant to a lender. For example, the FICO score doesn't reflect anything about your job history, which we mentioned earlier is something that might be important. So the FICO score isn't the whole story about your credit, no matter what other people might tell you. The thing that actually comes closer to being the whole story about your credit, though still not the whole story, is your credit report, which is created by a business called a credit bureau or a credit reporting agency. Credit bureaus collect information about borrowers, organize the information into a usable form, and then earn a living by selling this information in the form of credit reports to potential lenders. Credit bureaus often specialize in business credit or consumer credit, though there's nothing that prevents a credit bureau from maintaining information on both types of borrowers. 
Credit bureaus collect information about your use of credit from banks and other businesses with whom you have a credit account. They also collect credit information about you that is a matter of public record. Anything that the government makes public, like bankruptcies and court settlements. They also collect information from collection agencies. Finally, they also keep track of the number of times in the past two years that they've sold your credit report to a customer. The credit report is a relatively comprehensive set of, of, of information about how you've used credit. But again, your credit report isn't the full story about your credit. When a lender buys a credit score or a credit report, they could simply be using these tools to supplement their own credit analysis. The lender will have you fill out a credit application and collect additional information about you that hopefully does help tell the full story about your creditworthiness. This is what happens when you apply for a mortgage. The mortgage lender will doubtlessly get a copy of your credit report and your credit score, but they'll also request a lot more information that will help them assess your five C's. For some kinds of lending, the lender is satisfied with a credit report or even just a credit score. And that's why we receive these pre-approved credit card offers in the mail or email. The credit card lender is satisfied after looking at your credit report or FICO score that they would approve your credit application if you applied for their credit card. So instead of waiting around for you to come to them, they go to you in the form of a pre-approved credit card offer. Similarly, if you've ever been approached by someone offering so-called instant credit approval, chances are that the company offering this credit is only looking at your credit score or your credit report. Because it's all electronically accessible, it only takes an internet connection to be able to buy this information and view it almost instantly. This still leaves the question of why some lenders would be satisfied with a limited check of your creditworthiness, while others will want to get the full story. And as you might guess, it depends on what's at stake for the lender. Take credit cards, for example. The lender is lending for a short period, one month at a time, really, and in limited amounts. If you misbehave with a credit card at any time, the credit card company can close your account and require you to pay off your balance immediately. On top of that, the credit card company is charging a pretty high interest rate, so they're getting compensated pretty well for the risk they're taking on. Because they're not as highly exposed to the risk that the borrowers can't pay them back, they can afford to forego a lengthy credit analysis on their potential borrowers. On the other hand, think about a mortgage. It's a long-term commitment, usually 20 to 30 years. The amount loaned is large, usually well over $100,000. The loan is backed by collateral that's hard to value and which can be hard to sell. To top it all off, the lender has to offer a relatively low interest rate or the mortgage won't be affordable to the borrower. So the lender of the mortgage has some really good reasons to be extremely careful about who they lend to. They need to make very certain that only very good borrowers are approved for mortgages, or else they'll lose a lot of money. This helps explain why you'll probably never be free from credit card solicitations. They're filling up my email inbox too now. But the mortgage lenders will probably leave you in peace. In the next lecture, we'll think about the next step in taking out a loan. If you apply for a loan and successfully make it through the credit analysis process, the lender will offer you a loan contract. Now the ball's in your court. Should you take the lender up on their offer or look for a better deal someplace else? Needless to say, the answers are buried somewhere in the fine print. And that's what we'll learn about in the next lecture.